Hello and welcome to the podcast. You're here with Physique Development. Uh, this is episode 71. Today we're going to continue on with the myth busting series. Today's episode is about a question that gets asked quite a bit um, throughout my question boxes. I'm sure your guys' as well, and really just across the internet, and that is, is high protein intake unhealthy? So I first want to start with a disclaimer. So I think that's very important. We are not medical doctors or registered dietitians. This is not medical advice. And we are speaking to what has been shown in the research among healthy resistance trained adults. If you are someone who has metabolic disorder or kidney dysfunction, please consult a qualified medical professional. Okay, that's out of the way. All right. So first and foremost, I, I think the first thing we do here is define what protein is, right? What is protein? And then we'll sort of open up the floor and talk a little bit about our own experiences with protein intake, especially early on in our journeys here. Okay. So at four calories per gram, dietary protein is essential to life and means the maintenance of our health, especially when considering its importance in building muscle and maintaining muscle, the growth and repair of tissues and cells and structural roles within connective tissue, bones, organs, and things like that. And unlike carbohydrates and fats, protein does not have stored reserves to use when availability is low other than the muscle itself, which we don't necessarily want to take away from, right? And this is why consuming adequate amounts of protein daily is important to reduce the chance of skeletal muscle breakdown. All right, so with that out of the way, I wanted to open up the floor here and talk a little bit about protein. I know Alex has a story past as far as his cuisine. Yes. Um, pre be cookbook days. Um, and very interesting. So get your notepads out, take notes, and learn what not to consume um, if you have taste buds. So Alex, do you remember your protein intake when first starting with <laughs> Um, it was excessively high. So I, I do want to preface this with you guys that I was maybe 150 pounds, maybe. And I was dripping following, wet. yes, dripping wet for sure. 150 pounds. Um, I was following Jay Cutler's diet. Um, it was actually out of muscular mm -hmm. development. And this is, I had this, uh, I ripped out the page. I remember this plan as day, um, and had taped the page of his diet onto, uh, my bedroom wall. And the protein consumption for this, if I'm remembering correctly, was 300 grams. <laughs> so, and I would take my meals to class and we had, I think, six or seven periods of, of class at that time. And I would try to eat all those meals that Jay Cutler was also eating when he was just relaxing at home and training, but I was going to class. And so I would eat throughout the entire period in which we were trying to learn and then be so full, but then I'd have the next meal that I was supposed to eat basically by the next period that I had. And so I was just shoveling food all day. Um, I will tell you that I did not grow to be as big as Jay Cutler in that first year of trying to do that, where I was very diligent with getting my protein in, um, almost to a fault to where I was almost like chronic, like daily sick, basically <laughs> making myself <laughs> sick with the quantity of protein that I was getting in. One of those meals that I remember very abundantly that makes me sick looking at now is that I would have uh, spicy tuna packets. I'd have two of those, which I think came out to like 35 or 40 grams of protein by itself, an entire container of cottage cheese, and then I'd put relish in it. And it came out to be like 75 grams of protein every time. And I would eat that before bed alongside those who cannot handle dairy. When I tell this story, they're like, oh my gosh, your stomach had to have hated you. And I'm sure that it did, but I was just unaware of my digestive stress in general. And then I would have a half gallon of chocolate milk with that every night. Shout out to Angel and Brian Bush for um, funding this experiment that I ran on myself um, with the half gallon of chocolate milk alongside the entire container of cottage cheese that I was consuming every single night. My mom was very 
frustrated with the grocery bill that she would come home with every single week. <laughs> um, but they wanted my dreams to become a reality. It still has not happened. The, <laughs> me getting to J color size is still not a thing. You're kidding. <laughs> No, I know. Oh, I know. It's no. crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Wow. Um, you fooled I, me. Man. Yeah, I'm, I've fooled a lot of people, I'm sure. Um, but that is the initial part of me tracking my um, my protein. And the best part about this story is I've had the privilege of hearing this story from so many people in Alex's life at that time. And they all tell the same story. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's not it's not fabricated. <laughs> and each person is like, this is exactly what he ate. And it is ridiculous. Um, it is absolutely ridiculous. We'll one time have to have like a story time episode and have Cody on and him say <laughs> your first summer together when you were all in on fitness um, and what that looked like. I mean, Austin was there too. Yeah. Um, I think that'd be a oh, fun, fun story time. <laughs> yeah. um, you but, should have Cody on though, because Cody will absolutely better represent it more than I <laughs> yeah. would because I'm underselling it <laughs> and I'm hyperbolic. I'm pretty hyperbolic as it gets. And Cody still Hobbs talks about will come that. on. Oh, dude, he'll come on and he'll he'll blast me away as far as uh, hyperbole. So <laughs> yeah, his storytelling ability is very great. Um, but <laughs> uh, it's something where we even will watch um, like Max tuning on YouTube, and Alex will be like, he eats like a child. And I'm like, that's exactly how you would still eat if we were not together. That is true. The The meals that I would create were just ramen noodles and then chicken, but they were not seasoned whatsoever. It was just chicken that I had made on the stovetop um, that was not good. I, I mean, it was you know, questionable times where it was maybe a little undercooked, but pushed through because I had to get the protein in type situation. Um, yeah. And still, Salmonella is anabolic. <laughs> exactly. Anyway. Austin, I know that for sure. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. people say things like, well, you do it better so like you can make the food. And at first I thought it was him like making excuses because he didn't want to cook until I fully understood the extent of his cooking skills. And now even if I make a meal that he doesn't love, he sometimes won't even say something about it because he's like, beggars can't be choosers. <laughs> I know what I would make would be a lot worse. <laughs> And now you know, it would be tuna packets, cottage cheese, and some relish right before bedtime. Super And yummy. a half gallon of chocolate milk. <laughs> um, myself, Ugh. I do not have as crazy as a story. Um, I will say that I probably had pretty decent uh, protein intake as soon as I got into lifting more regularly. Now, I was doing that with a lot of like IIFYM foods, lots of protein shakes and protein powder dishes. <laughs> but uh, probably growing up, it was around 70 ish grams uh, on a daily basis growing up. Yeah, mine, I, um, I couldn't tell you. My mom used to force feed me for sure because she, I, so the claims of me on, some sort of performance enhancing drugs throughout middle school and high school, the jokes were pl uh, plenty. Um, and people would like legitimately ask my mom, what's he, what are you guys doing? You know, uh, what's he eating? She's like, he just eats normal food. I just make him eat a lot, uh, which was true. Cause it's like, she would, she would just get the word from the coaches that said, Hey, this kid needs to eat. And so, uh, I ate. And when I was full, it was like, hey, here's dessert, eat that. Um, so it wasn't necessarily like the cleanest, the healthiest, whatever you want to label it. Um, but it wasn't unhealthy either. But I, I did not actually start to track or honestly pay attention um, to the amount of food or caloric intake I was sort of taking in until, which would, would have been 2013. Um, and that was really when I started for the first time to train for a, a bodybuilding type of physique type of training to actually start to gain muscle, right? Uh, leading into that, it was just, how can I get stronger, faster, more powerful, right? And um, so leading into that, I, I remember my first protein intake was around uh, my first macros I ever remember tracking was 200 protein, 200 carb, 50 fat. Yeah. This was my first prep. Okay. Um, so it's, that's around 2000 calories. And so this is my first prep. I'd never tracked macros before. I'd never, ever really paid attention 
to my food before. And this was the show that I prepped for six weeks. So I, I ate those macros um, for six weeks and was shredded at the end. <laughs> and I was stoked. Um, and I came out on top. It was, it was a happy day. Um, still don't understand any of what <laughs> happened, but um, here we are. So it got me into sort of what we do today, which is, which I'm grateful for. But yeah, my first protein intake honestly was not high. Um, and cause I, you have to also like, I was, you know, my freshman year of high school, I was 185 pounds or something. So th I didn't start tracking macros until sophomore year of college. So second year of college. And so by that time, I, I mean, I was still probably, I was probably a, a you know, relatively lean 190, 195, 200 pounds. I, I remember getting up to 205 back in that day, but that was kind of like, I remember looking at that and being like, I do not want to look like this <laughs> right now. Uh, I'm going to go back to what I was doing. Um, but all things said there, like 200 grams of protein, you know, relatively relative to what it probably could have been. I never really touched the upper echelons of 300 grams. Like, like Alex over here. And we'll talk more about kind of that type of protein intake and, and all of that stuff. But yeah, that is, um, that's fantastic. I always love remembering that story and it's always <laughs> told a little different every time, but also the same facts make their appearance, but yeah. the, uh, the storytelling always gets a little bit better each time. And Hobbs definitely has to come on and, yeah. and tell those stories. Yeah. So you guys will absolutely enjoy that. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. Um, so what is high protein intake? I, I think that's a great place to kind of start, right? So the current recommended di uh, dietary allowance, the RDA, um, is set to 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram per day, okay, which is relatively low, right, if we, if we look at that. Um, and this number is often disputed, uh, but has been found to be adequate for meeting the needs of healthy, non-exercising adults, right? So you're healthy, you know, adults that don't necessarily go to the gym, they don't exercise really, they just kind of go about their day and, and do their thing. That protein intake seems to be sufficient enough for them. Okay. But it is clear that more protein is required for adults looking to optimize strength training adaptations, i.e. putting on muscle strength, etc. And the current suggested amount of protein intake for exercising adults is between 1.6, so double the RT, RDA, to 2.2 grams of protein per, per kilogram per day. I'll say that again, 1.6 to 2.2 grams of protein per kilogram per day. Uh, and this can travel upwards of three, four, even five plus grams of protein per kilogram per day without any adverse effects being shown. Now, as we get into three, four, five plus, grams per kilogram per day of protein, that's a lot. So looking at Alex's protein intake back in the day, that was closer to the four grams <laughs> per kilogram of uh, body weight there. And so, or per, per kilogram. And relative to grams per pound, that's roughly two grams per pound, right? Four, four kilograms, you know, four grams per kilogram is roughly two grams per pound, okay, for those in the US who uh, d absolutely don't know that uh, difference, um, which outside of being and reading this research, I probably wouldn't either, so I don't blame you. Um, so high protein intake for the normal person, I guess, for the non-exercising healthy adult would be anything that's over the RDA, right? 0.8 grams uh, per kilogram per day. And if you ask the ISSN, the International Society of Sports Nutrition, which are speaking more to healthy exercising adults, it's high protein is somewhere above two grams of protein per kilogram per day, right? So more than double 
the RDA is considered a high, quote unquote, intake uh, of protein per day uh, from the ISSN. And in a popular 2014 study by Antonio and colleagues, they took 30 participants that consumed upwards of 4.4 grams of protein per kilogram per day, which was closer to Alex's range here, which was 300 grams plus. I think it was like 308 grams per day or something. Um, and they, in that study, they didn't, this study in particular, the, the researchers didn't actually take blood panels to determine any sort of negative side effects. Um, but some participants complained, and this is a relatable note and callback to Alex's story, participants complained of GI distress and feeling a chronic rise in body temperature, which in high school, as you're going through puberty, sounds awful. Um, Cause I can remember I was hot enough <laughs> as a teenager <laughs> going through high school, like the classrooms in that old high school were like, some were absolutely frigid and others were a sauna. And I lucked out to get all of the sauna classes apparently. Um, so I was a very, just all around, just like, I'm always like super hot. And it's just like, dude, I'm so uncomfortable. Um, and I can't imagine sitting in there and just scarfing down food. The whole time. The whole time and raising your body temperature. And I, I do remember there was a couple other people in particular that used to also bring food to class. And I remember staring at them, even like being someone who was like into sports and into weightlifting or whatever, I, I was so out of the loop and like didn't even consider it, didn't think about it. And I, there were multiple people that would do it, Alex, Alex being one of them. Um, he was never in any of my classes, but guys in my grade um, definitely did it as well. And I remember sort of looking at it. It's sort of like when someone opens up a can of tuna or fish or really any food on an airplane and you're like, dude, you're opening up this food container in this hot box and no one can esca escape. What are you doing? Like, so every, I would just like, they would open up this food and everyone would just like slowly turn and look at them. Like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? And I can't imagine dealing with that. Um, Alex, did you get any questions during this time about your? Oh, of course. I think the the teachers were the most inquisitive of like, what is wrong with you? Why don't you just wait until yeah. lunch <laughs> to eat your food? Why are you eating in my class? Stop doing that. You are a disturbance to my class. Um, Cause I also had my gallon jug. Don't forget that. I had my very large um, lunch box that I had in my right hand and then I'd carry my water in my left hand and that I would just have my hands full all day. But I thought that I looked so cool because Austin had talked about Austin's a year older than myself in, in school and in real life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in general, uh, but yeah. The, the guys that I thought were also cool, which I thought Austin was cool as well, but he wasn't doing what we were doing. Um, there <laughs> was, I'm not that cool. Yeah, there Never. was cool guys yeah. in the grade above me who were also doing that. I think the person that yeah. sticks out in my mind is Austin Warren, who is also a very jacked human being, um, may still be to this day. I, I'm not sure. I haven't he, seen. He def I, last time I saw him, he was pretty still young. jacked. He was, he was preparing for preparing for Navy SEAL training. Okay, so, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, he was go. the inspiration more so <laughs> on that front because uh, he was doing that. Um, but yeah, a lot of questions and and um, definitely didn't help. I will say for the guys who are like, putting on muscle is gonna help me with the girls. I think the girls were probably more um, ignoring me at that point or annoyed with me, probably more annoyed with me that I was getting the food out. So I wouldn't say that that was like getting me the ladies by any stretch of the imagination. Sue, can you speak to this lady um, <laughs> hypothesis? You got me. <laughs> this is true. But I wasn't carrying around a gallon jug and a lunchbox every day when I met Sue. So this is true. take that for what it's worth. <laughs> take that for what it's worth. Exactly. Um, to add to this body of research, another study was conducted uh, in 2018. So that previous study was in 2014. This study was done in 2018, again, by Jose, Jose Antonio and colleagues, uh, where five participants, much fewer, but uh, I think this study speaks to uh, what we're talking about today, even more five, uh, participants consuming upwards of 2.6 all the way up to 5.8 grams per kilogram of protein oh, for over a year period. So this, this was actually a two year study and the first year it was slightly lower. I think the, uh, the upper limit that they consumed that first year, these are sort of averages based off of my fitness pal three day logs that they would turn in. Um, so again, take that for what it's worth. But again, if you have five dedicated bodybuilders over a two-year period who are 
being supplied free protein to hit their protein goals, you can almost guarantee that these are pretty accurate numbers, knowing that, you know, the three people here who are pretty neurotic about their protein intake. Uh, I would say that if we were getting free protein, Trust. we would just be like, yeah, send it, dude. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So 2.6 all the way up to 5.8 grams uh, per kilogram for over a year, uh, really over two year period. Um, and we're given routine metabolic panels every six months to assess if they experienced any adverse effects to their liver or kidney function. And these panels showed liver and kidney function to be unaffected over that time period. Again, this is all relative to healthy strength training or exercise, exercising adults, resistance trained adults. Um, again, all this information is just what we have available. So again, consult your physician if you are questioning anything and or think you have something going wrong. Um, but that is to say, and really to open up the floor to the, the first major question or myth that is commonly asked, is high protein, protein intake bad for your liver or kidneys? And from what we have in the literature from healthy resistance trained and exercising adults is it seems if you're healthy and active, there are no adverse effects to higher protein intake. Now, there are some things that I think are worth mentioning, and that is, and I answered this question uh, in a question box on Instagram the other day when someone asked, can I actually consume too much protein? And I answered in a way where it's like, I'm sure you can, but you'll probably never get there because you're going to run one, you'd have to probably be north of this five, almost six grams per kilogram, which is just a lot. That's over three grams per pound of protein consumption, right? That's a lot, a lot of protein every single day, right? And what you're going to probably run into is more GI or gastrointestinal distress and problems before you ever reach that point, right? I think we can all sort of get to that place uh, here where we can say like, hey, I've definitely consumed since that point of starting to track macros and getting into bodybuilding and stuff, I've definitely had my intake close or north of 300 grams per day for quite a while. And what I'll say is one, you get sick of eating food, especially protein. Cause like protein is not, the thing about protein is it's not typically, or at least the types of protein, lean protein sources that are kind of the healthiest to consume, especially at that quantity, aren't the most satisfying and tasty of all of those things. And again, protein is more satiating. So it, you get more full as you consume it. And again, you'll start to run into some GI distress, some, some stomach discomfort and things like that, the more and more you consume each day. And I wanted to ask you guys and kind of pose this question, have you guys also run into this? Um, and at what point did you kind of notice this, this breaking point for you? Is there a sort of an upper limit that you guys have here? Yeah. Um, for myself, it's normally around 50 grams of protein that if I eat that in one sitting, I just don't feel my best. And like Austin alluded to, it is also going to depend on the quality or sourcing of that protein. Because there have been times where maybe I have 30 or 40 grams of one source of protein and that just does not sit well with me versus having it with a more whole food source that is going to sit better. But if I push past 50 at all, then that is going to not feel my best, and especially if it's all from one source. So for example, my breakfast is a little bit higher protein, but I'm getting protein from some protein powder, um, from bacon, from eggs, from yogurt. So I'm getting it from multiple sources, and I find that that's a lot easier on my stomach as well. Yeah, and I think that um, one thing that we really teach our clients is structure and and habit building within their protein intake from a day to day standpoint. So more so, we're thinking about the uh, the construct per meal, as Sue alluded to, within understanding that upper limit that she can handle digestion wise is that we want to have that lower limit be roughly 20 to 25 grams so that we get the engaging of muscle protein synthesis. So it depends on how many meals the client is wanting to have from a day-to-day -day perspective. What is that upper limit as Sue talked about? And then having that lower limit be 20 to 25 grams. So we're kind of working in that ballpark to ensure that we're getting adequate protein to allow for us to recover um, as well as have better training performance and those different factors. 
Yeah, and it's super helpful to break it up into per meal because if you're just going, this is for all the macros, but if you're just going for one overarching goal, you can be going throughout your day and then you always get to the end of the day and it's like, why didn't I get to where I needed to go? Or you're like left with an odd allotment of macros. And especially for protein, if you can decide, all right, I'm going to have most of my meals be around this number, um, it's also going to optimize your results. We get questions all the time of how can I optimize results. And if we're looking at protein, having your protein evenly distributed throughout the day is going to give you that better anabolic response than having a skewed distribution pattern, even if you still hit the same amount of protein. So take that into consideration as well, especially if you are wanting to optimize those results of being able to have that even distribution is going to be really helpful. I'm not sure that the literature fully supports having, like if we are to take in 200 grams and, and correct me, Austin or Sue, if you guys have read this differently, but um, of having 200 grams of just like two meals of 100 and 100 relative to having uh, four meals of 50, 50, 50 spread throughout the day, I believe that to be uh, a better scenario and better for digestion. And I think that we can all agree on that. But in terms of results and those different factors, I feel as though, and what I've seen within uh, the clients that I've worked with, that I've had better results relative to doing just two massive meals of 100 grams. But I believe from a research standpoint, that hasn't been concluded. Not that I came across. Um, so if you guys are interested listening, uh, Dr. Ben House, a huge shout out to Dr. Ben House and his website, Deconstruct Nutrition. Uh, it's a great website where, uh, one, he's just a great writer uh, and he breaks down things in a, these complex topics in a, in a more digestible way. He does a great job at that. Um, so you guys, if you guys are interested in diving really, really into um, someone who is, I would label, has a healthy obsession with understanding the totality of, of everything when it comes to really nutrition especially nutrition, but training even as well. Um, he's a great resource. So I think it's like $8 a month. It's worth it. And it's, it's always a great read. But I remember reading um, one of his more recent articles that he wrote on that site, and he was kind of going over distribution. And to what he concluded from all of the studies, uh, systematic reviews, meta-analyses, all the things that have been taken on protein, um, pretty much everything we have on protein, it seems that the most optimized way to do it is as you guys are saying, and as we do practice with clients, which is uh, between this 25, you know, as a lower bumper, because we need that leucine threshold, right? So high quality lean protein sources, right? We need that within there, there's an amino acid uh, called leucine, which we seem to need a threshold of to sort of turn on this machinery within the cell that kind of tells the cell like, hey, thumbs up, we're good. We can kind of turn this stuff on. There's other things that play too, like total calorie, uh, the total calories that you're consuming and, and a lot of other things that are sort of going on too, that sort of not only initiate that sequence to happen, but also to fuel it and to maintain it because there also seems, and we'll probably go into this. I know we're going to have a nutrition series. We'll probably have a more in-depth protein episode. Um, so we'll, we'll go into more to, we'll go in more here within that episode, but, um, I think it's important to note that, especially as Alex mentioned, that it's probably the best to get, have that 25 to 40 grams per meal. And that kind of tells you how many meals based off of your protein allotment you're setting per day, how many meals you sort of need to have. And so there's sort of this period of time too, where as soon as you intake this protein and your cell kind of gets that signal, it says, hey, thumbs up, we're good. Um, there seems to be this, what's called a refractory period, um, where your cell goes, hey, we're good. We're not gonna listen to any other signals for three to five hours. We're gonna do our thing. We're gonna turn our sound off and just not listen for a while, put on our noise canceling headphones on. We're doing our thing. Uh, and then as soon as that sort of you know inverted U kind of comes back down, the spike of muscle protein synthesis, all of that, as soon as that starts to come back down over that sort of three to five hour period, you can, sort of do it again, right? And during that time, your cells working on laying down new proteins, either to repair damage that has happened or to lay down new proteins to say, hey, I understand what you're putting me through here. I'm gonna lay down new protein so we can handle this better and better and better as we move forward, which is how you start to grow muscular protein, how you start to grow muscle. Um, 
within the cell. So that is something there. And, and to answer the 200 grams, he touched on that um, and said, essentially, there's nothing that states that we can't do it. And there's plenty of people too. I, we've all seen these people too that do this, you know, one meal a day approach or two meals a day approach or whatever, where they're consuming 100 grams to 200 grams per meal, depending on, you know, if it's two meals a day or one meal a day. Um, and we still see those people put on muscle tissue. We still see those people, you know, who are lean and jacked and whatever, right? We all know the whole equation there. We don't know what else is going on um, all the time. But what I will say is that there doesn't seem to be anything that tells us we can't do it. Um, but there seems to be, which is a lot of what we work off of here, there seems to be more speaking toward the approach that we take with clients, which is those more tolerable doses that do initiate muscle protein synthesis appropriately and adequately. And we do that, you know, three, four, five times per day, which allow the body to on average put either put down protein to repair the cell or put down new proteins to repair the cell rather than go through protein degradation, right? Where proteins actually breaking down because our body's constantly going through this ebb and flow of protein building, protein breakdown, protein building, right? And our nutrition and protein intake helps skew that a little bit more where we have more of a ratio towards protein building and less of a ratio towards protein breakdown, right? Which allows us to have that positive ratio of protein uh, balance within our body in general. So, And I thought of one thing as far as a study. Um, there is a study that talks about, I mean, just the protein feedings as a whole, and it is more beneficial for keeping muscle mass on if you have four feedings versus having two or three feedings per day. Um, and like having four or five is going to be more beneficial, especially when you're in a dieting phase. And then if we're looking at the inverse, if you're thinking, well, should I just have protein like every 10 minutes and have like five grams every 10 minutes, we do want those to be bulk protein feedings. So that's why we're mentioning that minimum of that 20 to 25. That's going to be the minimum to maximally stimulate muscle protein synthesis um, so that we can have those peaks because we want it to peak and to come back down instead of having a flat line throughout the day. And, and the flat line isn't going to necessarily happen because once you once you peak, it has to come back down to your your baseline. It's not that you're going to be able to peak and then be like, bro, I'm just going to keep shoveling protein down my throat <laughs> and I'm just going to stay yes. <laughs> anabolic the whole time. One, you would age like a crazy person. Um, is it Benjamin Button in reverse? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so you would age like crazy. Such an interesting life. movie, dude. Very interesting. Um, <laughs> so you wouldn't want to do that, nor could you do that. But uh, that's just something to to note. Yeah, and your body seems to have its own protective mechanisms around that. And it seems to, again, our bodies are way smarter than we'll ever be. Um, so we can do all that we can to start to understand what the body is doing and how it optimizes itself and how we can optimize it with nutritional interventions or training interventions or whatever. Um, but at the end of the day, the body does what the body does. And we're just here to try and optimize it. Um, and that does seem to be the best way to do it. Right. And I often make a cross comparison to, um, training volume, right. When we talk about training volume, this is kind of like, well, it has shown in the research that instead of doing like, if you're doing 16 sets per week on like your chest, for example, like it's better to do to split that up into two or three training sessions rather than do it all at once right so our body seems to like this i need enough of a stimulus to reach a threshold to turn this machinery on and then the machinery is going to work and then it's going to stop working temporarily and then we need to sort of turn it back on again right instead of like these super large boluses of training or protein or whatever and okay, we're good for the rest of the day or we're good for the rest of the week, the month, whatever, right? Which is not necessarily uh, the case. So if you are a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there, we'll get a call scheduled and I look forward to speaking with you. I wanted to ask a follow-up quickly to that relative to um, clients here. So you know, what are some things you guys notice with clients if protein intake is too low or too high? 
Yeah, I'll speak to it being too low. So when we look at protein, I know we've talked a lot about protein when it comes to either maintaining muscle or growing muscle, but it is also going to be so, so helpful when it comes to your immune system. It's also going to be helpful for giving you energy, um, for keeping you satiated and being able to have that muscle uh, muscle side of it as well. And so what I see with clients that aren't getting enough protein in is they might have energy crashes throughout the day. They might be in a place where they're getting really hungry after their meals or they're having a hard time focusing um, when it comes to their food if it is going to be biased towards biased towards carbs and fats. Um, Also, I might see that they have like really brittle nails or hair um, and they get sick a lot because their immune system isn't getting the support they need from the protein. Um, So those are a few things I see pop up for people if their protein intake is too low um, and it's often not talked about enough, I don't feel like, because a lot of people are under that threshold for protein, and they kind of normalize some of these symptoms, and they don't realize that, hey, this is likely because I'm not getting enough protein in. So if you want your body to function optimally, I would highly recommend making sure you get in enough protein, because no one wants to be sick and have brittle hair and nails, or be in a place where you can't change your physique to to where you want to. And I will speak to it being too high. So with high protein consumption in general, one of the biggest things that I can recommend to you is to change the texture of the protein that you're consuming because the texture of these, if you're just consuming chicken, more chicken, turkey, ground beef, the textures are going to drive you insane and your palate is going to be like, bruh, I am not hungry for that junk you keep feeding me. One, either make it better or not make it so dry. Um, Two, let's change things up. Let's use some Greek yogurt. Let's have a protein shake. Let's use some of these different sources, maybe some fish, what have you. So make sure that when you are taking in higher protein that you are – changing the texture of the ones that you're consuming. Now, the issues that arise when you are having too much protein are going to be lack of appetite. Um, Energy is going to be dull from the sheer fact of poor uh, or the – GI distress that you're experiencing. So you're going to feel bloated. You're going to have distension. You're just not going to feel all that great. Um, you're, you're going to feel kind of sluggish and slow. Those would be the things that I notice. Um, I wouldn't like we, we had talked about within the research and those different factors within the liver and kidney values. This is something even with some of the, um, like bigger bodybuilding guys that I've worked with when we look at blood panels and they're eating 300 plus grams of protein, oftentimes this is not something that I see liver or kidney values being elevated um, either. So still in that scenario from a small sample size of the individuals that I've worked with, I'm not seeing the blood panels being off on that front, but I will say the GI distress, feeling sluggish, um, potentially hindering uh, training performance because of the discomfort. Like as many of you can, uh, uh, relate to when we have GI distress, it affects everything. Your your mood, it affects your your energy, it affects your training performance, all these different factors. And so the more that we can optimize our digestion, the better off that we're going to be as a whole. And so that's the main thing that I see when clients are taking in too much protein. Yeah, and if you want to know how to make your ground proteins taste better, we'll have a YouTube video linked in the show notes or in the description box because we can help you out with that. Shameless plug. Always. The most shameless. Um, to that point as well, uh, to Alex's point there of, of going too high, you know, there's also uh, a situation where you're going to run into where, especially if you're in a category where you sort of would label yourself a hard gainer or someone that can't put on consistent weight or muscle tissue or whatever uh, over longer periods of time, super high protein intake also can negatively impact your ability to intake other macronutrients, which are important for that process to occur, like carbohydrates and fats, right? So we need carbohydrates and fats, not only for energy production and, and hormonal health and everything else, and to drive these other processes down the line that help that protein help initiate. But also we need that from a a caloric perspective when putting on size and weight, especially over the long term, right? So if you're constantly sort of putting yourself into a, a bad situation with super, super high protein intake, where you're like, I'm just not hungry enough to consume everything else. And also if you look at, you know, the calories per gram that 
protein is, right, we, we do need to match that with carbohydrates, which again are close, again, four calories per gram, but also fats at nine calories per gram can help us boost that up as well as far as calories go. So if you're eating so much protein that you're not able to eat other macronutrients, that's definitely going to take a hit to your caloric intake. Um, and to that point as well, and I, I wanted to sort of save this until after we talked about that, but both of those studies, the, the 2014 study by uh, Antonio and colleagues, but also the 2018 study by the same our similar group uh, by Antonio and colleagues, both studies did not show an association between higher protein intake and more lean mass gains to what you may expect, right? Two of those, I think two of those participants gained what would be categorized as a significant amount of muscle, which again, within research, that doesn't have to be a ton to make it significant. Um, but the others didn't seem to make any uh, significant gains within their muscle mass, which is interesting and probably shows that there is a point of diminishing returns on your protein intake, right? There seems to be this, well, as long as we're hitting this threshold, we're probably good, right? And it's gonna, this is something that we'll probably go over in the other protein uh, episode as well. And it probably does matter as well, like what your current goal is of what you're consuming, right? There does seem to be a threshold, which we talked about, which is that 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram uh, of protein. But anything north of that really is relative to, well, are we trying to lose body fat without losing muscle mass? Are we trying to put on muscle mass? Are we training for endurance? What are we doing? What's the point of this, of what we're trying to attain, right? And that, that seems to matter when it comes to uh, our protein intake as well, right? So it all is contextual as long as, again, we're hitting that sort of lower threshold. We're probably good for all intents and purposes, but as we get more contextual to specific goals, things start to matter a little bit more. Um, you may actually find that you can, some people need a bit more relative, especially if they're new to training, right? There's more damage that happens when you're new to training. So you may actually need more, which is interesting. And the more you train, and depending on where your calories are, if they're super high, you may actually be able to get less and still be effective, right? Which is also interesting, but for another day. Another question that floats around the internet um, that I was able to sort of dig up and read more about, um, and I've definitely seen it, um, but definitely less so than the liver and kidney things, but has to do with bone health. So is high protein intake detrimental to bone health? Right. And we're not going to go too into the weeds on this, but I did want to cover it for those that have, may have heard this and wanted to sort of get the take on, um, you know, what is within the research when it comes to, because like with anything, there's two, you know, there's multiple camps and tribes of communities and people who either are like, dude, this is fine. Or dude, this is the end all be all. You're going to have osteoporosis in five years if you keep eating protein. Right. So. The main argument around this is that high protein in Western diets is highly acidic. That acidity increases calcium excretion rates alongside lowering our urinary pH. This combination, which is important, leads to the demineralization of bone, which in return may, quote unquote, lead to osteoporosis within these claims, right? But there was a 2018 study, again, by Antonio and colleagues. Antonio is just prolific in today's <laughs> really episode. He's all about the protein. He's a, yeah, he's, he's up there in terms of protein research. He's up there with like your Stu Phillips as far as the totality of research that he's published around protein. Um, as far as like numbers game, I'm not, I don't know who has, you know, done more, doesn't matter. But Antonio's up there with Stu Phillips in that, um, in the protein game. He does a lot of protein research. Anyways, that 2018 study found nearly identical markers of bone health in both groups. Uh, despite an 87% increase in protein intake between groups, which is 2.5 times greater than the RDA, right? There was a, there was a controlled protein, like a lower protein intake group and a, a higher protein intake group where their protein was set 87% higher and which is 2.5 times greater than the RDA. Um, and there was no difference, sizable difference, especially within markers of bone health, right? And this fares alongside other systemic reviews and meta-analyses that high protein intakes, especially when paired with activity and resistance training are safe and effective for preserving bone health. And we will put these 
studies within the show notes. So you guys can go explore them, read them, um, and all of that. But that's that as far as protein goes. Is protein bad for liver and kidneys? Doesn't seem to be, as far as we know, with healthy exercise and resistance training adults. Same goes for diminishing your bone health with high protein intake. Doesn't seem to be the case. There seems to be more overwhelming evidence that, in fact, higher protein and also with used in conjunction with exercise, being active, being healthy and resistance training that we actually see these things maintain or start to reverse or actually improve over time, right? Which is what the whole shtick is around like, hey, as you become older, you still need to eat protein to maintain muscle mass, which can help you maintain strength and independence in your life, balance, coordination, all the things that muscle brings us as far as health, but also those muscles have to pull on what? The bone, right? <laughs> they have to pull on your skeleton. The stronger those muscles get, the stronger they're pulling on your bone and skeleton, the more you're probably active and moving around, which again, when paired with all these things in a healthy lifestyle are probably more often than not, I can say, are gonna lead to improved bone health rather than the uh, degradation of your bone health, okay? so. Again, we are not, not medical doctors. I want to keep continue to say this. If you guys have any questions that relate to medical advice, please do not ask the internet. Please ask a qualified medical professional in your area. If you still have a family physician, go to them. I haven't had a family physician since I was about eight, so couldn't tell you, but um, you should definitely go to the doctor if you have any questions. Do you guys have any, um, I'm gonna add some closing statements uh, here, but I, I didn't know if you guys had any closing statements or things just to add to the protein intake conversation or maybe just mention things that we'd wanna talk about in the next one potentially just as a sort of preliminary conversation. Just eat your protein. It's going to help your immune system. It's going to help your nails and your hair be healthy. It's going to help your recovery, which is also going to help your muscle building and muscle maintenance, which protein helps with as well. So it's also going to help with your satiation. It's going to be great for you. So get your protein in. Find a good way to make the protein. That's the the other thing, because I can tell you, I mean, getting the protein in is important, but enjoying your food is also important. So if you can find a wife that does a really great job of making your food, that's, <laughs> that is my recommended source. Um, I, I know that that's not possible for everyone, but that is the path that I personally took. And I can say that the progress within my physique, as well as the recovery of my muscles from training is exponentially better. Yeah. <laughs> so he's going to be the number one salesperson for the sous chef cookbook because yeah. uh, he lives and dies by it. I do. I do. Well, there you go, guys. If you guys have any Craigslist posts asking for partners or your Tinder profile, you can update that and just ask for anyone that can cook protein um, and you'll be set for life. Um, somewhere on the screen here, there will be that video. Uh, so click, click wherever it is. There will be that video of Sue uh, talking about better ways to cook, especially ground beef, uh, to make it more enjoyable and to actually last longer within your fridge if you are prepping food. So that's a great video. Um, and I wanted to add a last shout out again to Dr. Ben House and his website, Deconstruct Nutrition, uh, for aiding in today's information and also to Mass uh, Research Review, which is another great resource for you guys. I just wanted to credit those guys because they made the research for this episode so much better and less laborious. Um, or laborious or labor intensive on uh, today's episode, because that would have been a freaking nightmare without it. So mm -hmm. thank you to those guys. Go check out them. Uh, those are great resources as well, but we'll see you guys in the next one.